they hardly have enough space for three yeah. chairs. Yeah. All right, I'm uh, Robert Krupkot. I and now I, I want to warn you, I've been in Florida for almost three years now, so if I start to get cold, I'm going to put my jacket back on. <laughs> it's a little chilly in here. So, um, uh, I'm mostly making this up as I go along. In fact, some of you might have seen me making this up during lunch. But um, if you've not heard of Squeak before, Squeak is um, it's an open source Smalltalk 80. Uh, implementation. It's been around for actually quite a while. It's uh, available on many platforms, Windows, Linux, Mac, OS2, and Solaris. In fact, I do apologize, hidden cleverly behind the slideshow here is actually a Windows 8 machine. I uh, could not get my main laptop to connect to the projector for no reason at all, but really, see, it's here, it's here. Okay, so, um, uh, the, the current version is actually version 5X. Actually, it's sort of uh, being somewhat eclipsed by a spin-off project called Faro, which is the newer one. The latest version that is ported to OS2 is version 3X, which for my particular case actually works well. And I'll get into that a little bit, why I chose it and what I'm doing with it. Um, because now that you know what it is, you might ask why. Why <coughs> small talk? And my first answer, of course, is because. Uh, that's just the way I am. Um, I, I love programming on, I love programming with Perl, primarily because it irritates people. Uh, I like using OS2 because it confuses people. So programming in Perl on OS2 is down near, downright near Nirvana for me. Uh, but every now and then I like to overachieve and I figure how can I overachieve programming in Perl on OS2? Well, how about Smalltalk on OS2? It seemed like a one-up. Uh, next, I'll probably have to look for a fourth compiler or something for OS2. Um, the other reason is actually uh, me making good on a promise I made some 20 years ago. I had two mentors, actually the only two people I've ever worked for or with that I consider a mentor as opposed to a peer. And it was uh, back in the days when I was uh, but a young lad uh, programming in a procedural way. And I asked them both independently how to get my head around this object-oriented thing that everybody was ranting about. And both of them, unsolicited, un no hints, said small talk. Said all other languages cheat. Said if you can understand small talk, then you can understand object oriented programming. So I went and looked, and this was actually in the Squeak version three days. I downloaded it, put it on OS2, started tinkering with it. I actually never did much with it, because it turned out just hanging out with these two guys for any amount of time, I started to click and become a functional member of the team. And, and I, I got my head around that object oriented programming mostly. Um, so in a way, it's, it's been on my to-do list for 20 years, and, and so I want to do it. Um, the other reason is because actually one of the books I bought way back then, so this has been on my shelf for 20 years. It's in really nice condition. <laughs> so, um, but it's, it was actually, it's, it says uh, Squeak Learn Programming with Robots. It's by uh, Stefan Tukas, and it turns out this was actually written as a textbook for children. In fact, the target audience was about nine years old. And guess what? I have kids in that range. And it seemed to me that teaching them programming and keeping in mind what my own two mentors said about learning to program right, what it takes to get your head around this, I could have chosen any number of languages. There's all kinds of books out there right now targeting programming towards kids, whether it's Kudo, Python, all these different things. But I remember what my two mentors said. And my thinking was if I can teach them to program the right way, then they can write good code in any language. It's always been my contention that object-oriented programming is more of a design concept than a language concept. You can write object-oriented code in any language. I've even done it with bash shell scripts just to be obnoxious. <laughs> um, so you can do it. All right, it's more about how the things are arranged and what you do with them. And in fact, as I go through this process, it, it actually becomes a bit of an archaeology project. Uh, one of the things I found out, and I said earlier, that I got my head around object-oriented programming, working with these two guys, I actually only got it partially around it, as it turns out, because object-oriented programming is not about objects, it turns out. In fact, uh, Alan Kay was uh, 
quoted in an interview as having saying that he deeply regretted the name object-oriented programming because it caused everybody to focus on the wrong thing. The focus isn't on the objects, it's on the messages that you pass between them. That is the focus of the language, and that is what using small talk was supposed to be about. So, some of the resources. So this is another thing. When I started looking at this, of course, like I said, I looked at this 20 years ago. Well, it turns out these two books are still available in print. You can buy them brand new. You don't have to go to eBay or a used bookstore for them. In fact, they were probably these are still probably the most recent small talk books written. All right, so they're actually still available. You want to use this in a classroom, you can tell kids, go buy the book, and they can actually find it. But it also turns out that these books, because the people behind this, uh, like I said, this was targeted as a, as a textbook, but the, a lot of the people behind small talk, one of their motivations for small talk was bringing it to non-programmers, bringing it in particular to children and education. And what they were doing over the years is bringing that age down more. You saw some of this with COBOL and BASIC and stuff. It was a way to have allow college students, undergrads, dumb undergrads, help program the big beastly computers of the time. Well, these guys helped push that down further. And at this particular time, they had pushed it down to a nine-year-old. Um, but over time, they have pushed it down even further. So some of the modern iterations of this are things like eToys. eToys is, uh, I think it's actually logo-based, but it's all a lot of the same people. And they push this down into the elementary school level where you can do things in a programmatic manner that teaches the concepts of programming while basically all but playing games. And so to see all of that is just is very interesting is that progression. And so when I look to start teaching my own kids, in fact, I, I uh, kind of forced the issue past my own procrastination. Uh, by volunteering to teach a class of other high school and middle school kids. Um, I was able to find these books for one, but these books, because like I said, they're targeting education and stuff like that, they're actually released as PDFs under Creative Commons. So not only if you want to, can you just download them for free, save a tree, save some money, you can actually rewrite them if you want. Um, so the compilers are still available, the VMs are still available. Now it turns out the images for these books that go with these two things were remarkably difficult to find, <laughs> but I found them. So uh, I'm able to actually set these up on all of these different platforms. So I have kids with Macs and Linux and Windows. Um, and I was able to set up the 32-bit version 3.0 squeak on all of them until about a month ago when Steve Jobs decided I needed a kick in the butt. And Catalina is now, as Jan was saying, is 64-bit only. <laughs> so now I've got to figure that problem out. But um, it, it runs. The same thing runs on all of these. So I've got all these different kids running on all this stuff. And it's very, very interesting to see once we start um, doing with them. Like I said, I've got a range in there from, from uh, middle school and high school. And so they all kind of get it differently. And so I'm not really pushing a particular pace. I'm giving them bunches of stuff to do. And all of a sudden, you'll sit there. I'll be sitting there with one of them, and they'll be frustrated with it. And all of a sudden, they'll look at me, and their eyes will get this big. That one just got it. And to see all of them doing this and helping each other and having fun with it, really, of all the ways I could have gone for teaching with kids, this was the one to do it. Because as I'll show it to you later, the way it presents it, the way it, it brings it to them, it's keeping them all engaged. I've got even one high school, older high school student who's actually done some programming in Java, C++, JavaScript, uh, a few <laughs> other things. Even he keeps busy in the class, continuing to monkey with this because of your, uh, the ability to interact with it and do things with it, and in particular, this environment that was created. In fact, as I was searching for <coughs> these images, I actually got in touch with the author. I got in touch with uh, Stefan and um, started talking. He, he was a little bit surprised to get, uh, you know, an email <coughs> on this particular thing after so long. But he actually quickly threw back up a, a website that used to go with it. Uh, I don't know if he'll still go back and interact with it. But it was kind of interesting talking to him because they are working on the squeak by example with the new version, Faro. Um, but even they had kind of abandoned this. And I'm kind of hoping maybe to encourage bringing this one back on the newer platforms as well 
and on the 64-bit and stuff like that because of how well it works with uh, students. So where to get it? Uh, there is an actual OS2 port. Um, it's a couple of different versions. Uh, Juan Voltec is the one who ported it. Um, he has three downloads on his website. One is version 3, 3.0. The other one says it's the VM for it. It says on there 3.08, but I actually think it's 3.8. Uh, Hobbs has uh, version 3.5, I believe, on it. And then there's the Squeak website. Now, I list all of these for a reason, because depending on what it is you want to do, uh, you actually need bits and pieces from all of them. All right. Now, there is the third download on one side that I didn't actually notice until a couple of days ago. I downloaded it, but I thought it was something else that I was looking for, which we get into this later, you'll see with the confusion of the names, but it's actually the source file, it's the C code um, that he has. So um, I, I, I'm going to have to go take a look at that to see what we can do with it. Um. <coughs> now, once you get it down, basically, uh, and this is mostly true of, of most of the versions, you basically just pretty much unzip it and go. Now, the Linux version for version 3 actually has an installer script and it tries to install it in a somewhat Unix-like manner, which makes it slightly problematic um, because uh, it's so old now that actually most repositories have version 4 as the standard version of Squeak. So if you install things from the repository and then you install this one, then it's going to stomp all over each other. Uh, you do need to install on Linux, you do need to install uh, the 32-bit libraries. And depending on the distribution and stuff you're using, that's changed over the years, so almost all the instructions you'll find are wrong. Uh, but the concept is there. Basically, um, I became a little bit more familiar with the LDD command, which is like the PMDLL command for OS2. Basically, it's like, here's an executable, what are you looking for? And it gives you a list of, none of these are installed. And you have to go install those. <coughs> now, if you're doing it on Linux, the key thing to remember with those libraries is you typically have to put a colon I386 on it because the 64-bit um, the one probably is already installed, and it'll tell you it's already installed. So you need to force it to install the 32-bit the one also. On Windows and Macintosh, it basically just worked because that support's still in, built into the systems, pre-Catalina for Mac OS. <coughs> for versions 4 and 5, and the other ones, they went to a sort of an all-in-one bundle so it has all of the supported platforms in one zip file, you just blast it open and there it is, which makes it a little bit easier to work with. But it comes, what you're looking for out of it is um, four different files. You need the virtual machine, and in this case I mean virtual machine as in Java virtual machine, not as in uh, virtual box or VMware, all right? Uh, that's the executable, that's the application depending on what platform you're looking at, those are the different names it'll call it. It'll, it's the .exe file, all right? Uh, you need the sources file. Uh, now, depending on what we're doing, there's two different ones. You need the v3 sources or you need the v3.9 sources. So for Squeak version 3.0 up to 3.8, you typically use the Squeak v3 sources file. For Squeak 3.9 and 3.10, it's the Squeak 3.9 sources file, all right? Uh, I forget exactly, that's basically, I think, related to the image that you're using, because basically you fire it up and the image will squawk that it doesn't have the sources file that you want, so you have to have the correct one. Now, the ones for the book, the images that go with the books, uh, the Ready PC image, which is the Learn Programming with Robots, and the Squeak by Example, they need the, uh, Actually, I think the Ready PC Act, that's right. The Ready PC needs the V3 sources. The Squeak by Example, that book came out about a year later. That needs the 3.9 uh, sources, right? And then where your work actually is, is in the images file and the changes file. Those two are a matching set. They have to have the same name with the proper extension .image or .changes. So if you make backup copies and stuff like that, then those are the two that have to travel together. Uh, along with the appropriate sources file. But the, the sources file will be that exact name. Uh, that's exactly what the image is looking for, is that particular file. Um, and then 
the different versions of Squeak have usually a standard image file that goes with them also. So you can run with the same VM, you can run um, different versions of the images file. Okay? That's really where I think most of the, the versioning is. It's in that images file. Now, uh, I got asked this question earlier. No, I've actually never programmed in Smalltalk. Like I said, this is me making good on a promise I made 20 years ago, so I'm about a week ahead of my students. Um, <laughs> so, um, this is, um, so, so what this works is, it's interesting. This is the environment. This is a screenshot of the environment. And it starts out with your robot. This is your robot here. And the way it starts with the class is you, you click on it, you get a dialogue, and you talk to the robot. You tell it to go 30 or 300. You tell it to turn north. And you tell it to change its color to red. And that's how it starts the class out is just issuing these one commands to them. You go to the little bot factory here. This is our introduction to a class. You click on the bot factory, you tell it new, and it puts another one out on the screen for you. So this is the whole interaction there. This is how it starts out, okay? But then you can start to write scripts with your bot. You say, so I've got a little script here. Now I have to declare variables. I'm not gonna click on the new bot there, so I interact with the class here, and I tell it new. I set my variables, and then I do a loop a uh, thousand times, repeat, execute the commands, and I draw little squares on the screen there. So a lot of what they do, they start out working with just this sort of thing. Uh, now, of course, it is a full integrated development environment. It's a full IDE. Everything you need for Squeak is in the Squeak. So you never need to go to the universe outside of it. In fact, that was one of the design um, goals of small talk, whatever you did within there, it was all in there. Everything you needed was in there. So um, here we have a little script window here. We have what's called a, uh, the uh, transcript window. You can actually send messages from here to here. So if you do like just that sort of like print I'm here type of debugging, then you're going to write those in your script and they're going to, you're going to send those messages over to here. Uh, this is just a little file browser, and it, it's kind of interesting because it's the way it's object-oriented. There, there's objects. This is the script, and I can run it from here, but this is also the script in the file browser, so I can run it from here. And um, no matter how I basically make it appear up there, I can make it run. All right. So some of the quirks and smirks about it. Uh, it's small. To, it's small talk 80 as in 1980, as in before any of the other standards we've become familiar with existed. So, uh, for instance, all the cut, copy, paste, it's, it's still the second character is the same one we use, but it uses the alt key instead of the control key for everything. So it's kind of funny if you don't change that, which there's a way you can change that, but it's kind of funny, you'll be in one application outside of Smalltalk, say I've got a little text file with some scripts in it, and then I'll do a control A and then control C, and then I'll pop in the Smalltalk and I'll do alt V, usually. Sometimes I'll do control V and it will do something else entirely that I don't want it to do. And then I will do alt Z to undo that and put it back. Um, it's, it's like menu driven. Menus, 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 menus. There's menus all over the place and they're all contact sensitive. So getting your, learning all of that, that like I said, it's everything you need is right in there. So, and that was the way of presenting it. Um, today, the mouse, it's no longer necessarily the thing on our desk next to us. It's, it's a trackpad, it's a, a touch screen, it's one button, two button, three button, it's all these different things. <coughs> well, this was made for a three button mouse. So depending on your laptop and your operating system, how you simulate that three buttons is gonna change. And in fact, I go between these two right here. They both have track pads on them, but this one also has buttons. Therefore, the combination of left click and right click on this one and that one are different, uh, which control keys or alt keys or shift keys that I have to do in order to do it. So that makes, that makes using it a little bit um, confusing at times. So I've also found kind of oddly with uh, uh, like VirtualBox. So I have um, 
Linux as the host on here, and I have uh, VirtualBox running my, my ECS instance. For some reason, I'm not completely sure of, but I, and it's not a small talk thing, it's actually more of a virtual box thing, but I'll be in my Linux, I'll be on the host system, and I'll you know, select something, uh, control A, control C, and then I'll go into uh, my ECS VM, and I won't actually be able to cut and paste it directly into Squeak, I'll have to open up an editor, paste it into there, and then I can cut and paste it out of the editor into Squeak. So I, I don't know exactly what quirk drives that, but it's just one of the, it's just a slightly amusing thing. You can interact between them. It's just not necessarily in the smooth manner we might expect. Um, like I said, looking into this has become somewhat uh, uh, an archeological effort. Just going to look for something like trying to find the image files it led me down all these different tangents of history of some of the players who created these things, of some of the other things they created uh, while doing this when it was more in its prime. Um, so one of the things I, I'll do, so I've done a couple times, well I started out just looking like I said for the image file, but a lot of the links on the squeak.org site and some of these other sites are all broken, the things have disappeared behind them. Uh, so inevitably I'll end up looking at the download site from the file system perspective and I'll start wandering through there and I'll just find these things that uh, have disappeared off the website and it, they're people's projects and things they've done. One of the things I downloaded last night that I found even was a, uh, a small talk environment for authoring multimedia content for people who didn't want to use an expensive proprietary product like Flash. And it's all small talk. What happened to it? I don't know. How does it work? Still don't know. <laughs> but it looks pretty when I start it up. So there's just all of these different things down in there that uh, you know I'm interested in looking at personally. So there there are a lot of different things that they were doing that were really way ahead of their time. And in a certain respect, they were so far ahead of their time they disappeared into obscurity because we either uh, are just now catching up or still not actually quite caught up to what it was that they were thinking of then. Um, the books, um, Squeak by example, is actually being rewritten right now. I think it actually is rewritten. I think they're still working on the examples and stuff. But it's being rewritten with the new version Faro. So it's Faro by example. Uh, but it's otherwise, uh, according to the author, it's basically the same, same book, but geared towards the new product. So, um, it, there's actually still a lot of development. There's, there's continuous updates to uh, the notifications on work being done and stuff like that still. And the difference between uh, Squeak and Faro is very huge difference? Or I have not looked at them specifically. I think Faro is just more of a fork in the product. I think they just, at some point in there, Faro started, but then Squeak continued to evolve on its own also. So the specific differences between them, that far I haven't gone yet, because I was mostly focused on what was there for OS2, and uh, along with that, what I wanted for my class. Um, they're not necessarily connected, they just happen to be in the same time frame. So I can work both of those issues at once. You know why the guy stopped porting it? You know, no, in fact, I believe he's still active in the Squeak community. Uh, so on my to-do list is, is potentially a reach out and a ping to say, hey, you've got a fan. <laughs> so, um, so I haven't done that yet. Uh, but I believe I've actually still seen posts by him. And I mentioned something on one of the groups, and they referred back to him as, as being the one that did the OS2 stuff and some other things. Where does his day job? I think he was an educator. I, uh, I've got his um, website here somewhere. Did I go past it? Was it an EDU? Yeah. Uh, I, I've got it in a, in a browser window. I'll bring it up in a moment here. So, um, uh, there we go. That's what it was. So, um, this is the squeak.org website. This is, this is still where squeak is happening. 
Uh, Faro, I think, is off on its own website. But like I said, so wandering through this website is a bit busted up, but uh, you can still find a lot of things there. And then, like I said, it's still available. They're still doing downloads and updates to version five of Squeak. This is, his, this is the Squeak for OS 2 website. Uh, oh, it's his own website. Uh, but I thought he was an educator, I don't remember now. Uh, I know a lot of them still are in education. Uh, but right down here, so this basically what he's got pictured here is Squeak version 3.0, actually. <coughs> um, and here are the, uh, the downloads for his site are right here. Um, the Hobbs, this is the, it's the only one out there right now. Like I said, that's got uh, some bits and pieces. Uh, this is the website that the author threw back up real quick. He basically just pulled it off an archive. So again, a lot of the links are busted up here because he just put it into a, um, it's a, in a GitHub area. So uh, this is actually the author himself. So he's still active. He's still doing stuff, uh, in particular with Farrell. <coughs> um, now, so what I do really quick here is... Uh, What's that? It almost sounds like he's an entrepreneur, not necessarily a research or research oriented educator. Just looking at his bio. Yeah. Um, I, I remember doing some of the reading of his stuff. I, I, I mean, you may be right. I think actually because I may be because his wife teaches that he has such a close connection to the education stuff, and I think his research is towards the education. But what he's doing himself, uh, like I said, for his day job, I don't know. So this was basically one of the tasks that I gave my students uh, just last week, actually. I gave, them, I gave them a script. And this is one we had gone over before. I said, now, do something with this. I, I gave them some tasks. And I said, I don't want to see squares. I want to see circles. And so they had to sit there and monkey with this. And with this... And basically what I gave them was a small requirement. And so they had to figure out the, the, how to accomplish it. This is programming. And the part that I needed them to get to, which we hadn't done in anything else, was, and I had given them a variety of things. I said, you can do a lot of things with this. And this is part of where I'm teaching. This is where you start to teach them the programming concepts by sneaking up on it, is First, you show them how to interact with the robot, and then you show them how to give a list of commands. And of course, they start writing a long list of commands. And then you start teaching them how to put that in a loop, and then you start teaching them variables and things. And so what I taught them, what well, we got to a point here is not necessarily user input, but that's the same sort of thing. I've got one script that draws squares, but I want it to do something else. So let's make it do something else. So I change one thing, and voila, now I have triangles instead of squares, simply from changing one value in it. Well, maybe I need something else. So what are our other options? What can we do with this? So let's try. Um, so let's clear it. And uh, oh, there we go. Now now we've got, uh, we're starting to create different shapes and things like that. I actually need to bother to count it. Was it uh, hexagon? Uh, yeah. So, um, but you know, we're, we're end users, we're always making new demands, we always want something else. And say, so I really like what you did with that triangle thing, but uh, that looked great, but I'm a little bit of art nouveau, or I need to, need to come up with a, something a little bit different, a little bit more dramatic. So there we go, now we're talking. And uh, I had them walk through a lot of these different things. Let's do another one, what do we come up with here? And so we're sitting here doing all of these things. And then I say to them, I say, okay, <coughs> try another one. Let's keep going. What do we do? Let's go 180 with this one. What are we going to do with that one? So let's clear all 180 degrees. And, well, that wasn't very exciting. What happened? <laughs> and this is where I paused, and I made them sit down and think about it for a little bit. And I said, well, what were we doing? What were we changing? What was that, what was that uh, turn degrees thing? I said, well, that's how much we're turning, right? So... We turn 45 degrees, we turn 90 degrees. What happens when we're turning 180 degrees? Well, we're just turning around back and forth on ourselves. 
And I said, well, it went too fast for you to see, but because we're making the, the, all the other things, you saw them growing, they were getting bigger. Well, this didn't just draw a line. In fact, what it really did was it drew a bunch of really small lines really fast back and forth like this. Mm -hmm. All right? And, and so you, you're able to start walking them through a lot of what it takes to be a programmer by just setting them up for these little sorts of things. So uh, I needed them. I said, okay, well, I need you to come up with circles. So how are we going to do circles here? And ultimately, where I wanted them to get was something like this. And now we have circles. And I, I, I sat down with one of the students who was getting frustrated, actually, because he wasn't getting it right. He, he, he couldn't get it right. He was close, but he couldn't get it right. I said, well, show me what you've got. And so he did something. His numbers were a little bit off from what I did. And I said, well, that's it. That's there. He said, no, it's not. He said, it's, it's right here. It's, it, these are straight lines. I'm like, well, yeah. I said, how do you think we magically turned a straight line into an arc? I said, we didn't. We made a bunch of really, really tiny ones like this. And we've moved so little on our angle that we gave ourselves an illusion of the arc. In fact, when you look, he said, but yours is a circle. I said, no, look at it. You're looking at the center. It looks like a circle, and you've let your eyes basically not focus on the end. And I said, go all the way out here to the end, and look. Hey, that's a straight line right there. And he looked at it and said, did you do that to trick me? And I said, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly, he was engaged again. He went back into his computer, and he started working on the next task. So, and the next task actually was I had a double swirl for them. And the key they had to figure out there was that they needed not one but two robots. And they needed to travel through the same loop, but by default it's going to put the two robots on top of each other. So in order to make the two separate arcs, you actually had to tell one of them to jump just a little bit to the side. Which was one of the commands we had reviewed earlier, but now I was using it in a, diff in a different context. So the nice thing about this is these scripts that I have here, I've been cutting and pasting between Linux, Windows, and OS2, and I've handed it to the kids and had them put it on Mac OS, and they run everywhere, doing exactly the same thing. So what I have done with the kids is basically, now the author says in this book here, that these chapters you could make roughly into one hour labs. That's not quite what I'm doing with it, um, but close. Uh, basically what I have, uh, right now I have a lot of stuff in Google Classroom actually. And so what I did with them first, actually the very first thing I did was I uh, talked to them about binary. And I explained to them why binary mattered to them, more or less. And um, throughout this whole, in fact, what I ended up doing with them to help get them through was uh, their first computer program was written on a piece of paper. After explaining to them how binary worked and giving them a binary chart, I had a little light board that uh, my middle son had made for a science project and I co-opted it and brought it in. And I sat there and I turned on switches. And I said, okay, light bulb on is a one, light bulb off is a zero, write it down. And so they had to copy down, the convert the light bulbs into binary, and then they had to consult their chart. I could have actually been a little bit meaner, but some of them were middle schoolers. I didn't actually make them calculate the decimal and then look up the decimal value. I just let them look up the binary value and get the decimal value on the letter from that. And they went through the whole process I had a whole series of these, and of course, what was the first message sent? <laughs> it was, in fact, hello world. All right, so uh, what I have done basically is I go through, and some of the lectures will sit back and emphasize something else. Some will actually cover two or three chapters worth of stuff, and then I'll send them off to work on their own, uh, kind of taking it subject-wise. So my second lecture was on talking to a computer. And we, this is where we started to go over just some of the vocabulary. 
of what is a message, what is a class, what is a method, what are these different things we're typing. And I said, I said, I told you to type a number, right? So you type a number? No, of course you can type a number. It's small talk. It's an object. It just happens to look like a 10. So uh, I said, remember the binary class, all right? You can represent that as binary, hexadecimal, octal, or decimal. And so this is an object, and it has all these different things. And I showed them in small talk. I brought it up in a little window, like uh, highlighted the seven, brought up a browser for it, and clicked on it. And sure enough, it showed the octal, the decimal, and the hex values for that. Um, and basically, like I said, I've been working my way through the chapters. Um, one or two at a time, where we focus on different things. In fact, this one particular was just on the IDE itself and trying to work our way around that and do some of the different things, how to bring up the browser. Uh, what did I, I just deleted all my code, where did it go? Uh, how do I save my code now that I've written, as I explained to them, the, uh, the saying back when I started was save early, save often. Uh, the other way to think of that is if you have typed more than you wish to retype, then save it. <laughs> it doesn't actually have to be working, it just has to be more work than you want to do again. And, and this is also where we started with them, showing them, like I said, the IDE. I'm like, what happens when we're, we're typing in here and we get these little pop-ups or it doesn't do what we think it should do or I know that's not supposed to be that color because it does the dynamic syntax highlighting and stuff like that. And they, I, they've also gotten, they've gotten to the point where they brought me over a couple of times and said it's going red and I don't know why. So I said, all right, let's sit down and figure out what it is. And I explained to them, the most common mistake that you're going to make on any given line is not on the line where the error is, it's probably on the line before it. Right? And the most common one is they don't end it with a period. So, and part of explaining to them is that this is a language. It's, it's called a programming language for a reason because it's a language. And I have examples of it here, in here of how I walk them through English. And uh, I don't remember if this one was the one or not. Um, uh, that was probably the talking, yeah, because this was the mouse button. So here I, I, I yelled at my own son in class uh, as an example of English. Uh, and this is, this is a message, right? And you can cascade your messages. You don't have to say, Clinton, clean up your room. Clinton, come downstairs. Clinton, bring down your laundry. You can say Clinton and give him a list. And all of those things are the message. That's the way small talk works. It's just like in, in English. And I said, just like in English, um, punctuation is important. Um, was it not this one? Anyway, basically, I put up a sentence that said, uh, Come on, let's eat, comma, grandpa. And then I said, Come on, let's eat, grandpa. All right, all right. It looks like the mostly the same message, except for one little tiny mark, but that tiny mark is extremely important to grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Remember, every time you get the punctuation wrong in your script, you just ate grandpa. <laughs> so, uh, and, and so th this is the part that I add to the book, is trying to connect it, uh, connect the small talk to the rest of life for them. So, I know that's basically it. I'm working my way through the book with them. I plan on uh, most likely, so this one, this is the robot one. That's what this is all about. You start out by interacting with the robot. The entire thing is about interacting with the robot. But then you start modifying the environment and doing things uh, uh, increasingly more complex with it. This one here actually assumes you already know some programming. So it starts out a little bit higher level. Uh, it starts out basically, it gives you uh, a, a chapter on how to get around the IDE. And then it pretty much kind of assumes you know what a class is. It gives you a brief overview and you start building a game. So. Um, so that's what I've been doing with Squeak. Uh, like I said, obscure, yes. Uh, so it suits my personality. Um, if, uh, if anyone has any questions, give a shout out. But I guess it's, what, it's interpretive, right? It, 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 you do any changes, it happens immediately. Well, so it's just like Java. It, it, it's, uh, it's an intermediary. Everything goes through the VM. So. Um, 
Now, it's a little bit different in appearance, but that's what's happening. That's why, so that, that image and that changes file, you save those, those are what you can take platform to platform to platform to platform and run the same thing. Now, you can also, if you already have those, then you can cut and paste the scripts. In this case, we're mostly focused on the scripts. But when we get to the part in the book where they start actually modifying the classes and doing different things, then they will save those. Those will get saved to that images and changes file. And if you want to hand that over to someone else to do something, those are the two files you have to give them. I think that changes thing is like a source code repository. Basically, yeah, there's, it's a, uh, Monticello is uh, the name of their uh, versioning system. And so they actually have a, a, a repository where you can check things in and out also. Uh, so I don't know, so that's another whole area I haven't explored other, other than to locate it. It's, it's you, there's this whole repository of stuff people have been doing for some 20 years that's all checked in there that you can download and do things with. Does it have to run in the runtime system or can you create a standalone execute? So I'm not 100% sure on that. There's actually somebody who's trying to run it from a shell script and there's a conversation going on and I've been following it a little bit. Uh, my understanding is that, that mostly it's, it's intended to be run just like this. It's intended to be an entire interactive environment. That was its purpose. Um, but I do know that there is an implementation of Smalltalk, uh, GNU Smalltalk on Linux that is all command line driven. So no IDE or anything. I know with Visual Edge Smalltalk, uh, you would, there was sort of a packaging process. I, yeah, you I built this executable image and you didn't, it wouldn't be running the IDE. Right, I, I think that is true. So, uh, you know, like I said, so there's somebody who's trying to work on making something like that work right now. Um, so, one of the things, like I said, I found, just you know, sort of related to your question somewhat, but this is, this is the Sophie authoring environment. Now it's going off the screen here a little bit, but uh, this was supposed to be a whole authoring environment, uh, a, a counterpart to Flash. How it was supposed to be delivered, I don't know. But there's all these different things in here that you can do in there. And it comes kind of like uh, Adobe with a reader version as well. Uh, I mean, this is a whole lost product and technology in there, the, the what it's doing. Um, so what's that? A lot of them around. Yeah, exactly. And so it's uh like i said it is for me turned into an archaeology product or project as well so um like uh so quick another quick shot so what i had brought up earlier was the ready image this is a backup image so it's only showing the image files but for every one of these there's a dot changes file that goes along with it so this right here is the default squeak 3.0 image. So it fires up. Now it's got a whole bunch of other stuff here. Like I said it was designed for education. So there's a whole bunch of things in here with examples and things to get you started. All right. Um, this right here is uh, 3.9. They've changed it up a little bit here. All right. Is 3.0 the most recent OS uh, So, I run all of these images on, uh, on ECS. So, it's the VM that matters. And that VM, even though it's, it's definitely not updated past 3.8, depending on my interpretation of his numbering, or 3.5 that's on Hobbs, it still runs that 3.9 one, and it still runs the 3.10. So here, a lot of it's the same stuff, but what we've done is we've rearranged it. We've got little tool tabs all over the place instead. All right? And so this is them basically messing with the interface and what they do here. So basically, any 3x image, this one right here is the squeak by example. This is the one that goes with the second book. So this has all the stuff that makes the actual examples work. So without, now I've been, I've been told that, well, actually in the reading of this book, it says you don't actually need this particular image. In fact, I got told that several times by people when I was asking for it, but I'm fairly stubborn, uh, and I found it anyway. 
so, so I have this particular image. And so, like I said, all the stuff that you should do for this book, for either of these books, I have the images so that it's prepped and ready to go. But you can do, now, I thought this was all, it all had to be the 3X VM and, you had, and the 3X images went together. And then I sat down and one of my students was running the 3X, the ready image, the, the 3.8 image, in Squeak 4.2 on her Mac. And I'm like, I would say you can't do that, but you have just proven me wrong before I said it. Mm -hmm. So now I need to go look at that yeah. and see what. Is this simply a VM for the small talk implementation, or is this actually running in a Java VM as well? No, no this is all right. just small talk. It's pure native code. Yes. It, so it's implementing its own small talk VM to yes. the environment. Yes. Right. Yeah. Like visual H. Yeah, this is, you know, supposedly with a small, uh, they say that the code for the VM fits on a postcard. And then everything else after that is written in itself. It's all, all, all the small talk image is written in small talk. There's about one postcard's worth of code that makes up the VM, supposedly. So, in fact, based on what we downloaded from uh, one site, uh, that may very well be true. That may be exactly everything that was necessary for the the 3x VM. So what was it, uh, about 20 <laughs> files, headers, and C code? Yeah, I mean, uh, they've got a picture of a postcard on uh, Wikipedia. <coughs> yeah. I, 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 I've got to say, yeah. I don't really understand it, but <laughs> it's hard to believe that you could run Smalltalk with that little of a code, but maybe you can. <laughs> and, and that was that was literally, actually, that was some of the reading I did, that was literally one of their design goals. Yeah. Was to keep that part, the needs, that small. Yeah. Well, how would you add a capability to Java that was sort of native? It wouldn't be in your base class. It would be a, right. a helper native method. Maybe this is how small talk works. It's just, okay, I'm going to define object and the rest is up to you. Yeah, and that, <laughs> and that I believe that is literally it. I believe that's why my mentors told me that it is the, you know, the one true modern object oriented yeah. thing because there are no primitives. Everything is an object, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's how it was implemented. They, they had, because of that, there's so little there that everything now is basically a, an add-on. Mm -hmm. It's a module, a library, yeah. a class. So, and that's where they went from there. And I believe that's basically what's in the images and the changes file. Yeah. It's exactly that. I, you know, I, if I was going to try to rebuild it, the OS2 thing, I would want to contact the guy and ask a few questions. Right. I, <laughs> looking at what yeah. you showed it, me. It's, I, it's I, like I said, it's very much, it's, it's, a, it's, yeah. it's a very different approach to a whole lot of things. Yeah. Um, and it, it's just kind of interesting. After all that I thought I had learned about object-oriented programming, I start going through this stuff. I say, oh, that's fantastic. I did it wrong. So um, I, I'm, I'm interested in going back through it myself and taking what I thought I knew and mm -hmm. turning it maybe down the right path. Yeah. So. so I think that's about all I've got for it. All right. Well, thank you. If you want to, if you don't believe me, you want to see it run on OS2, it's, it's right here. We can do that later. <laughs>